All right. This might be the last lecture. I think we only had a, a couple more problems to do, but I, I wanted to uh, go in and I wanted to do sort of a, a review because we've talked about phasor diagrams, but we haven't been really been using them. And so let's just kind of look at this thing just a, a tiny bit, uh, a little bit more before we get in here. So let me go start sharing my screen with you. So where's my screen? So what I wanna do sort of like to think about where we've been, if I'm, okay, where am I gonna go? Man. So typically when we write a phasor diagram, we typically plot the voltage and the current simultaneously, even though what we've been doing up to this point here is that we've been looking at the, just the impedance here. But when we're actually looking at a phasor diagram per se, what we really wanna do here is that we wanna really show what we mean by the current and the voltage you know, leading or whatever that is here. So if I was to kind of do a, a brief review What we said here is that if I'm in the complex plane and I have a resistive circuit, okay, so I have a resistive circuit. What you're gonna find here, again, of course, this is the complex plane here, is that I could have some arbitrary vector, which I'll call the current, and let's say that the current is going in this direction. So this would be my phasor current. And what we know here is that we know this thing here. We know that, that there's a rotation going on. In other words, I, I know that this vector is rotating at an angle Oh, bad angle, I shouldn't call that theta. Let's call this angle phi. That it's rotating at some phi angle, which is equal to omega t. And so if I have a resistive circuit, then that means then that the phasor voltage and the phasor current are in phase, right? So in other words, in the resistive circuit, IR and VR, they, they rotate in phase. Now, the thing about this thing here is that one of the things that we don't typically talk about is that I should be really careful here, right? So I'm gonna say that VR is my phasor voltage. IR is my phasor current. Now, when I do a projection of the phasor voltage, in other words, I project down into here, what I'm really getting here is that I'm getting God, I'm running out of space here. Let me move this down a little bit. What I'm getting here is that I'm getting V of T. And if I project this guy onto this axis, I'm getting this vector I of T where V of T and I of T are the instantaneous values. And the way we get that, of course, is we take the, the vector, I mean, we take the, uh, we use Euler's. So the way we get these instantaneous values at this point here is that we have our vector, maybe that should, 
Maybe I should use X. And then we get, of course, this cosine of this X, the real part of X, which would give me X um, cosine, of course, of omega T plus theta, whatever that is, plus J X sine omega T theta. And in this case, of course, there is no phase difference between the two. So that angle is zero here. You know, I, gosh, I'm kind of screwing up here, right? It has to be that. That's what the Euler's relationship does. Now, the same thing happens with the inductor. If I look at this thing, I have a phasor vector that's going to look something like this. So now, if I have an inductive circuit, we could imagine that I still have the same current for an inductive circuit, right? So this would be inductive circuit. And so if I start to play that same game, then you could see here is that then this guy is out of phase by, of course, 90 degrees here. So if I look at this thing, we could see here is that this is VL. Again, that's IL. And if I want to look at the voltage at any one particular time, then I'm really projecting this guy and that's giving me VL. And of course this guy's projecting this guy and this will give me IL of T where we then have these instantaneous values right here. But that phase angle in this case, we're literally seeing that the phase of course is 90 degrees in this point here. And I can do the same thing with the capacitor. So if I look at a capacitor circuit, what I'm seeing here is that I'm seeing something very, very similar. So if I have something like this, I have my current looking like this. And then now my voltage is lagging. Again, by 90 degrees here. And this is my capacitive circuit. And again, each of these, of course, are doing what? They're rotating at omega t. They're all rotating at omega t, as we saw with the applet here. Now, the one thing that we've seen here in the past is that if I look at the reactances, and probably this is one of the most famous examples of AC circuit is that, um, that if we have an AC series RLC circuit, well, we can really just kind of look at this thing. And if you look at how this thing would behave here, of course, we would have some source. And of course, these are my, my phasor elements. And so if I wanted to calculate the current in this circuit, what is this phasor current here? Then we could then go in and we can just apply Ohm's law. So if you apply Ohm's law, then that means that the current should be the source voltage divided by the equivalent impedance. And if we write this in phasor language, of course, this is just gonna be R plus J XL minus XC going into Vs like this. So what we can do here is that we could go in and we could actually get the magnitude of this thing. So if I get the magnitude of this, we find that the current here is then going to be R squared plus XL minus XC squared square root divided into Vs. 
And then the phaser angle, of course, is then going to be XL minus XC over R. Now, the beauty of this thing here, when you start to look at this thing in the language of a phaser vector, here, here's what we're really happening here. What we're seeing here is that if I now plot reactances, what we're seeing is that we're going to see a curve that looks something like this. We know that the reactance of the inductor must look like this. We know that the reactance of the capacitor must look something like this here. And then if we look at some resistor value, maybe we could say that the resistor value looks like this. Now, what's really, really interesting about this thing, by the way, this is when I'm plotting Rx versus omega. The interesting point is this point right here. And what we find here, this point is known as resonance, the resonant frequency right here. And that would be the natural frequency of the circuit here. And so what ends up happening is that what's the beauty of this thing here is really when we go in and we start to look at the voltages. And just by looking at this thing, look what you're actually seeing here. What you're seeing here is that omega is resident at the so-called, when the driving frequency equals the, the, the resident frequency here. But the one thing that you should really look at here is that we can see here is that when the driving frequency which I'm going to call omega and then I'm going to say the natural frequency which I'm going to call omega naught and we can see when this natural frequency occurs here. This occurs when XL is equal to XC. And if you look at this thing, of course, this is going to be omega L, this is going to be omega C. And so this tells you here that omega naught is really the square root of LC. So everything is actually looked at relative to this thing here. And so what we should do here is that we should analyze this thing. So let's analyze the behavior of the RLC circuit. So when you look at this thing, when the driving frequency, let's break this up to cases here. When the driving frequency is less than omega naught, what you're seeing here is that XC is greater than XL. And that's apparent when you're looking at this region right here, right? In this region, you're seeing that the cap dominates. And then when we look at this situation where omega is greater than omega naught, then you're finding that the inductor dominates the cap. That would be in this region right here. You know what, I'm gonna move this guy out of the way. I'm gonna put this over here. But right here, I'm gonna say that this guy is omega naught. And then there's this magical point when omega is equal to omega naught. And in this case here, what you're seeing here is that XL is equal to XC. So the question is, what does this thing really 
look like? Well, what we can do here is that what this really implies here, so if I go back to when my frequency, let me write here, here's where the inductor dominates. And what you wanna pay attention to here is that let's go back to this guy here. This is the region of the green, right? And so what you're seeing here is that from Ohm's law, that tells you that the voltage of the cap is then bigger than the voltage of the inductor. And what you're seeing on the curve here, here's the beauty of the curve here. So let me see if I can do this right. And I'm gonna be plotting voltages versus frequency. And I'm gonna to try to see if I can space this out nicely. So this is going to be omega naught. And so what you're seeing here is that if you look at the voltage of the cap, when it's in series here, what you're gonna find here is that the voltage of the cap is gonna look something like this. It peaks at low frequencies. Let me see if I can get this right. Because you never start off with an infinite frequency. And that's because omega, you, you'll never get an AC circuit with omega. So there is no point. Okay, so let's be careful here. There is no point where omega is equal to zero or it's infinite, right? That's, otherwise it wouldn't be, an, it's not an AC circuit. So here's what you find. What you find here is that you start at some frequency that's not zero. So you're, you're really kind of starting here. And what you're seeing here is that it peaks in the cap and then this guy starts to die off like this. This would be the voltage of the cap. And what you're seeing here is that it dominates at low frequencies. And then if you look at the cap, the inductor here, this is our red region right here. If you look at this, again from Ohm's law, you're finding that the inductor dominates the cap in that region. So if you go and you plot this guy here, what you're gonna see here is that this guy relatively starts off low here. And then you're gonna see here is that it's sort of like, ooh, they sort of like dominate and then they cross and it goes off like this here. So you're seeing here is that when you go and you measure this, you can see that there's a region where the inductor dominates at high frequency. So what's really interesting about this thing is if you now look at the voltage of the inductor, okay? So that means we're looking in this region right here. We're looking at this particular point. And what you find here, this is in essence, what you're seeing here is the reactances cancel each other out. And so when you look at what's happening to the voltage, you look at the voltage of the resistor and this is what happens here. It essentially comes in and what does it do? It actually peaks right here. So this guy the voltage of the resistor peaks at that particular point. Now that's really, really important, it turns out, in an RC circuit here. And so when you're looking at the phasor diagram, if we look at these phasor diagrams up here, what you're seeing here is that these circuits are never 90 degrees, okay? It, it can approach at high frequencies, it goes to 90 degrees. At low frequencies, it goes to minus, it, it goes to that negative 90 degrees where your, 
where you're looking at the current versus the voltage, but it never really has that. So what you're seeing here, so if you start to look at the phase diagram, so if you look at the phasor diagram, this is what you're finding here. If I look at the region here, let's go back again. If I look at now this guy here, you're seeing that VC is greater than VL, which tells you that XC is greater than XL. So if I look at this phasor diagram, what you're seeing in this situation here is that you're seeing this type of thing. You're seeing that if I look at the current, yeah, the current, let's say, is going like this here, okay? So the current in the circuit is this here, but now what you're seeing here is that you're seeing voltages. So I don't know how this voltage is gonna come out, but it's gonna look something like this. Here we go. So you can see here that the voltage of the inductor, you know, I gotta change the current color. So I'm gonna change it to this color right here because I wanna keep red. So what you're seeing here is that this is my current in the circuit. So now look at the voltage of the inductor. Well, it's smaller, okay? Look at the voltage of the, in the cap, well, it's bigger. Look at the voltage of the resistor. Well, let's say it's this big right here. And what you're seeing here is that this is what you actually find right here. So now I'm gonna use the parallelogram rule. If I use the parallelogram rule, I'm gonna actually make the green one a little bit longer because it's gonna make it too small. So if that's about one and a half. I'm gonna make this, let's say, like this size right here. And you're gonna see that's one, two, three squares, one and a half, so it should be two and a half. So what I'm seeing here <coughs> is that this guy roughly comes up to here, roughly comes up to here. <clears throat> and so what you're seeing here is check this out. This is the vector sum of VC, VL, VR, and that is the voltage source value. And although this looks, and then this is the angle theta. So what I'm doing here is that I'm using KVL right here. So the thing that I want to actually, oops, sorry about that. The thing that I really want to show you here is that note that before we calculated voltages and phase or current and phase. So if I go back to the circuit here and some complicated value, what we're doing here is that look what we did here. We calculated the voltage. In this case, we didn't calculate the current here but these values, as we get these more complicated circuits here, where we're using, in this case, we're using node analysis, what you're seeing here is that I'm, when I calculate that voltage and that current, it's very similar to looking at something like this. When does the capacitor dominate? And then you would have to really show what is going on here and then you could sort of like start to relate what's actually happening here. So in this case, what you're finding in this circuit here is that in this scenario here, what you're finding here is that the current leads the voltage. It leads the voltage and they're out of phase. And it's this diagram that's really telling you this thing. And you could see that we're gonna do the exact same thing if I now go to the second piece where I now say VL is greater than VC. So in this case here, then we have XL 
greater than xc. So if I go and I draw my phasor diagram, you could see how I'm pro where I'm going to probably go with this thing here. Because now I could have, let's say I have something like this. Here's my VL. And then this time, let's say it looks something like this, where this is VC. And then my resistor is exactly the same length because it's not frequency dependent. And then if I use the parallelogram rule, you could see here that I'm going to get a vector that kind of looks something like this here. So in this case here, if I drew this correctly, which I'm not going to get a really good picture here. So I'm going to make this just a tiny bit longer here. What you're finding here is that the parallelogram rule in this case is going to give me a vector that that's going to be somewhere, damn, it's going to be like right here. So that means here that if I look at the parallelogram rule between these three vectors, this is going to be my voltage source. And when I look at the current here, the current will have a phase between these two vectors right here. So that means if I look at this angle between these two guys, this is my phase. So when I look at this diagram right here, you could see here is that Vs leads I by just a little bit. So if I go back and I look at my curves, here's what you're seeing here. You're seeing if that's the case here, then you're probably looking at a spot, the instantaneous voltage at the spot right here. So it's not that much you know, farther ahead. And so you're seeing that this is always the case here. Now at the magical point, where VL equals VC, you then get to this point here, and then you get a pure resistive circuit. And so at this particular point then, you're literally getting something that looks exactly like this. And then this uh, voltage looks exactly like this here. Let's say this is it. So when you're looking at this thing, it's exactly like that. Now, unfortunately, I didn't really do this very well, but what you find here is that when you get a circuit like this that's pure resistive, this implies here is that the current and voltage are in phase. So that means that the current of the circuit is exactly like this. But remember, this shouldn't bother you too much because this thing is rotating with omega t, right? These guys are always rotating with omega t. So I could, I could have waited a little bit longer. You probably wouldn't have liked it if I did this, but I could have drawn it so it looked like this here. And that would have been okay to draw it this way. You may not have liked it, but that's a totally legit way because this is a rotating system here. So the thing about this thing is that this is what they call a series resonant circuit. And a series resonant circuit looks something like this here. So if I have some phasor circuit, and let's say this is a 100 ohm resistor, and then I have my cap, and then I have my inductor. 
then of course I have something like this. At resonance versus another circuit that looks something like this here, where now I take my resistor and make it a 10 ohm resistor. Where again, I have the exact same inductor values. Here's what you really find here. What you find here is that we know that when I match the impedances in the, the AC circuit, I'm going to get this blue curve right here. So what happens here is that you can see here is that this guy has a larger resistor. This guy here has a smaller resistor. And so when you look at this circuit here, you find that it looks something like this. At resonance, let's say this is omega naught, the red curve looks broad and flat. The green curve looks very, very thin and sharp. This is what they call a high Q circuit. It's called a high quality circuit. This is what's called a low Q circuit. And what you're finding here is that when you, you're looking at this thing here, here's what you find. Is that one analogy that we can use, by the way, there's numerous analogies that we can use, but the one that's most commonly used is a car radio because people typically don't have radio stations. And what you have in a car radio is that you have an adjustable station knob. Now, if, so if one has a low Q circuit, one can get multiple radio stations simultaneously. But if you have a high Q circuit, only one station comes through. And the way you can really understand this is by looking at the phasor diagram, looking how the voltage and the current are, are in phase. When you're doing in phase, that means that the inductor and the capacitor are not impeding the flow of the current. And so therefore, the current peaks at that point here. So if I was to actually look at this thing, let's say that I'm plotting current versus frequency here. So that current is a maximum when the impedance is at a minimum. And if you were to actually plot the reactance in this case, or the impedance of the circuit, you would see here that if this is again, omega naught right here, you would find that the impedance of the circuit actually goes like this and it hits a minimum here and then it starts to rise up. Again, this is showing here that this is where XL equals to XC. And that's where the phasor diagrams become really powerful as we go and we actually start to look at these guys here, which I think is, it's just a, a nice application because, you know, a lot of times people look at these circuits and they go like, who cares about these circuits, right? Why would I care about them? And so what I wanna do here is that I just wanted to try to give as much application to this scenario 
as, 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 we, as we could here. So I think we only have two more examples left. And let me go get them. And I'll try to stop doing uh, too many applications. But we've talked about Node. I think we should go in and we should talk about Mesh. So I have two examples to finish here. So let's go do these things here. You know, by the way, um, I have my lecture notes someplace. I don't know, really know where they're at, but I'll upload them if, if that would be of any interest to you. But yeah, that's what we want to go in and do. So here we go. So what I'm going to do here is that, you know what, that's a really crappy one that I want to I don't really want to do this circuit. Let's do this one. This one's cleaner. I think I want to do this right here. And so what I want to do here is that I want to go in and I want to use mesh analysis to actually solve this thing. So if I'm going to use mesh analysis, then it makes sense that, that if we count the number of loops, then I'm just going to use phasor circuits to actually do this. So this time, what I thought that I would do here is that I'm going to maybe not do all the phasor calculations. Maybe at some point we should we should actually do the phasor calculations on some of the circuits, but this stuff gets really tedious really fast. So let's see what actually happens. I might just rely on a calculator calculation just to put the numbers in. So again, we have two loops. So therefore, I must have two loop equations. And it seems like the easiest way to actually do this, that I'll probably go, I'll call that phaser one, and I'll call that phaser current two. Now note that they're always they're already set this way. What I what I have found here is that when you look at these values here, note that the voltage source is in polar form, but XL XC is in rectangular form. I think it's good practice to always have only one form. So the first thing that I'm going to do then is that I think it makes sense to actually convert the source into rectangular coordinates just to be consistent. So if I look at this guy, I see that I'm going to have, so my phaser looks like this. So then, of course, then I'm going to get 24 times cosine of 60 plus J, 24 sine of 60. And if you compute this, I ended up getting 12 plus J, 12 square root of 3. So that's what source I'm going to use. So now I'm going to write up the loop equations. So if I write up the loop equations, I'm going to start with loop 1. And then you could see that I have two with one mutual. So then I should then go ahead and just start right in as we did before. So the first one here for loop one, it should be what? Four plus J six times I one minus a mutual minus um, J six times I two. And then I have to look at the sources. I see that I have a minus sign. So then I take the minus sign to, to the other side and I get a positive. So this should be 12 plus J 12 square root of three. That's loop one. So now if I go and I do loop three or loop two, excuse me, then I could see that I have three components. So then I'm gonna go, so the first one's gonna give me, I'm gonna get eight minus J four plus J six 
I2, and that's going to give me a minus. And then if I look at the 1, I have one mutual, which will be J6 times I, I1. Ooh, I got my signs wrong. Should be like that. And since there's no sources, that's equal to 0. So then if I put this into matrix form, we could see here that it's got to look something like this. So I'm going to get 4 plus J6. Why am I, right, this should be J6 with the minus sign. Then I'm going to get minus J6 for I2. And then I'm going to get 8 plus J2. And this should be I1, I2. And then if I look at my constants, it's going to look something like this. Okay, so now that I have that, I could then go in and, and uh, do this here. So then if I use the game, again, the same, what I would use here is that I'll write it out. using Kramer's. So if I do that, you could see that I1 in this case is then going to be, I'm going to replace all my, again, these are I1s and these are of course I2s. I'm going to replace my constants with the I1s. So then I should get 12 plus J, 12 square root of three and zero. And then I should get minus J six and this should be eight plus J two times the determinant of this guy. And the determinant of that guy is gonna be four plus J six minus J six. And then finally eight plus J two. And then if I, all I did here is that I punched it into the calculator and I ended up getting two point, I ended up getting um, 2.2 plus J 1.2 amps for I1. Okay. Now I also happen to put this into polar form, which is 2.5 amps with a phase of 29 degrees. Okay, so now I have my my current I1. Of course, I do the exact same thing with I2. And if I do I2, then I just replace my, um, my I2 terms. So then my constant should be 12 plus J, 12 square root of three, zero. And then I have the same determinant D right here. So if you compute that, I ended up getting in this case here. Wow, I didn't write it into polar form. I mean, I, I, I only wrote it into polar form. I wrote it as 1.82 with an angle of 105 degrees amps for I2. So I must have kept that everything in polar form. So then you might say, now that I got this, what's what's the, the use of all of this thing here. Well, I could, now that I got that, look at this, I could use Ohm's law to calculate the current. I mean, I, or the voltage across the inductor, I could go get the voltage of the capacitor. And so what do I mean by that? Well, let's calculate the voltage across the cap. So if I do that, what am I actually seeing here? Well, what we calculated, if you look up at the circuit, we calculated I2. So if I look at I2, I the voltage of the cap should be the reactance of the cap times the current of the cap. And the reactance of the cap, of course, is minus J four times I two, but note that this is 1.82 
e to the j 105 degrees. But note that this is in polar form and this is in rectangular. So the idea here is to convert this into polar form. So if I convert that into polar, so I go from rectangular to polar, and you can see here is that this guy, actually, I'm going to move this over. I'm, I'm going to run out of space. So if I look at this thing here, you could see that in polar form, this is going to be four times 1.82. And then I'm going to get e to the minus j 90 degrees plus 105 degrees. And so right away, we could see here, uh, I'm messing up with my signs. So if I put j here, this is going to be minus and that's plus. So then if I multiply these together, you can see that this is going to be under 8. So it should be 7.28 volts with the phase of 15 degrees. And that's the voltage of the cap. And I think this is quite surprising, right? We're using Ohm's law to calculate the voltage of the capacitor. But right away, if I want the instantaneous time or the instantaneous voltage, I could then come in here and go like, oh yeah, it's actually 7.28 volts cosine of omega t plus 15 degrees. And that would be the voltage of the cap, which is, you got to admit, that's, if you could get past the the matrix calculations, this is a much nicer way than solving a second order differential equation. And the same thing I can do with the calculating the voltage of the inductor. So if I go calculate VL, if we go back and we look at the circuit here, you could see here is that VL is the difference between the I1 and I2. So if I go and I look at this thing, I would then say, that the voltage of the inductor should be the reactance of the inductor times I1 minus I2. And if I1 is, if this is positive, then that means that the current at that instant is going down. So if I look at this guy, then this is going to be, again, this is J6. But remember, I should write this in polar form. So I should have 90. And then I got to multiply, I got to subtract two currents here. So then the first current, I1, is 2.5 with the phase angle of 29 minus the other one, which is 1.82 with the phase angle of 105. And so if I multiply all of this out, in the end, what we end up getting here is that I get a value that's going to read something like this here going to read, I have 6 times 90. And in my calculator, I actually did this in polar form and I got 2.71 with the phase of 113. And so if I compute that, I get 16.3 uh, volts with the phase of 78.7 degrees for the voltage of the inductor. So if you're looking at this guy, look what you're actually seeing here. If I have an inductor, in this case, you are seeing that the voltage leads the current. But if you look at the cap, look what's happening. The current is not leading the voltage. And the reason why that is here is that this is a more complicated circuit. Right? I can't ignore the inductor and the 4 ohm resistor in this circuit. So you have to look at equivalent impedances that are actually going on. So it gets trickier as to what is going on when the, something like that is happening. Okay, let me go get the last one. And this is a 7-in-1. 
So if I look at the 71, it's going to be our last circuit. Yeah. Let me see if I can grab this guy. And here it is. So let's go calculate the seven and equivalent. So as you could imagine that now we're just kind of moving quickly here, just trying to get a sense of where we're at with this thing. And so let's look at this thing here for a moment. So what we want to do here is that we need to convert this into a phasor circuit. Once we get this into a phasor circuit, we got to go calculate VOC and I short circuit. Okay. And then we could calculate ZTH. So obviously what we need here is that we need two things here. Okay. So the first thing that we need here is that because this is a Thevenin, we need to go in and we got to do what? We got to determine VOC, I short circuit. And then only then can we then go get the Thevenin impedance. So let's go do this. So the first thing that I would do here is that if I look at, I want to go in and I want to go determine VOC. So if I'm going to determine VOC, the first thing that I got to do is I got to convert this guy. Maybe I should do that first before I do anything. So I need to convert into a phasor circuit. So I could see that omega is 500. So this tells me immediately that I have a cap. That's the only thing that I got to do here. And you can see here that this cap here tells me that I have Xc, which is going to be omega times C, which will then be 500. And then I have, this is going to be 150 times 10 to the negative 3. So if I compute that, the number that I end up getting here is that I end up getting 3 hundred ohms. So now I have my reactants. So if I now go in here, I want to go redraw the circuit here. So if I redraw the circuit, here's what I have. I have a nine volt source with zero phase. I have a 600. I have a cap. And this guy's going to be minus J 300. This is 600. Then I have this guy here, which is a dependent source, which is 2VX. And we could see here that that VX is across the cap. And then this guy right here represents my VOC here. Now, when I look at this guy, we can see here is that this guy right here is the same as VX. So how do I do this? Well, there's lots of ways to do this here. Probably the, I mean, if I, if I think of nodes or if I think of loops, where am I looking at here? I mean, if I think about this in terms of nodes, we could imagine that we put the ground here. We know what this guy is right here. Of course, that voltage here is nine zero here. So we know what that guy is. I would come in here and I would define this node right here as my VX node. And then of course, this node over here should be my VOC node. And so if I look at that, I have two equations. 
right? So if I look at this, I have what? I have one, two, three nodes. So I got three nodes minus one source, x minus two sources. So I have one unknown node, right? One node, but then I look at this guy and you could see that this node here is what? It's a super node. This voltage source is not connected to the ground. So I can see here that I have one super node and it's gonna be VX, VOC. So automatically I have a super condition for uh, VX. And so therefore I'm gonna have two equations, two unknowns, which will be VX and VOC. So let's go do it. So now, here I go. So I'm gonna start off with my super node. So my super node equation. So I'm gonna start off with Vx. So then I'm gonna get 600 minus, minus J300 times Vx. Ooh, I got that right. Then I have this is connected to the ground, that, that is the cap, but the 600, then I'm gonna get uh, one over 600 <coughs> times nine, no current sources, so that's equal to zero. Wait, wait, no it's not, I gotta add the cap here, right? So this is for node VX. So now I gotta focus on VOC. So VOC has one over 300 times VOC, I have no mutuals it's connected to the ground and I have no current sources, so this is zero. So this is node VOC. So now I gotta go apply my super condition for VX. So my super condition for VX, well, not the, no, for VX and VOC, tells me that I can see here that this is gonna be VOC minus VX minus two VX. So now I can go matrix this. So now if I go matrix this, what am I seeing here? I got my VX, which is gonna be 600 minus J, 300, and then this guy's gonna be minus one. When I look at my VOC, this is gonna be 300, and the other one's gonna be one. Oh, look at VX. I have to bring this guy over. So this is actually a three. So here's my VX, my VOC. Now I'm gonna look at my constants. So here's my matrix. So then I have VX, VOC, my constant in this case is gonna be nine over 600, and this is going to be zero. So now I'm gonna go after matrix magic. And if I do that, I end up getting this guy. I find that VOC is then going to be 3.71 volts at minus 16 degrees. So I now have VOC. Now let's go determine I short circuit. So what I'm gonna do here with I short circuit is that I'm gonna just bring the circuit down with me so that it's just a little bit easier to deal with this. So so here's the circuit right here. So now what I'm, I wanna do here is that I wanna go determine I short circuit. So when I look at the circuit, what we're seeing here is that again, I have my nine volts. I have my 
resistor, which is 600. This guy is minus J300. Then I have my dependent source. Then I have this guy here. And now we want to calculate I short circuit. So I want to put a short here, which is then now I short circuit like this. <coughs> so when you look at this thing, you could immediately see here that the cap, that the 300 ohm resistor is dead, right? Right away, we could see that that guy's zero. <coughs> and let's not forget about this guy here. And if you're seeing here, this guy is dead. And this is a short. Now, I think I wanna draw this again because there's a, a little bit of a subtle issue here. You may already see it, but let's, Check it out nonetheless. Okay, so if this is the case here, look what you're seeing here. This is I short circuit right here. So the thing that's really surprising here is look what you're seeing. If I do a KVL loop around this loop right here, do a KVL along this loop, what you find here is that with the KVL, I'm gonna get minus VX minus two VX equals to zero. The only way this could be true is if VX is zero. So right away, that means here that the cap and the um, dependent source are shorted out, right? So this immediately tells you that the cap and the, the dependent source are shorted out. So my actual circuit looks like this. where this is 300, and then this guy is I short circuit. So according to Ohm's law, the only way this could be true here is that if I have, um, I have that I short circuit is then gonna be the voltage source divided by this 300 ohm resistor, which then gives us um, it's 0 0.3333, it looks like 0 0.15 amps at zero degrees, or we could go one, two, three, 15 milliamps at zero degrees for I short circuit. So if that's the case here, now we have our 7N imp impedance here now. So I could now go calculate this. Where's my mouse? So the seven n impedance which I'll define as ZTH, then looks like this. VOC, I short circuit. And then if I look at this thing, I know that my current is zero one five amps at zero degrees. Now I gotta go get my voltage, which is uh, 3.71 at negative 16, so I get 3.71 volts at negative 16 degrees. And so this tells me here that this guy then 
I'm going to get is 247 ohms with the phase of 16 degrees. And that's what this guy is. So in, in theory, I now have a circuit. And what this tells me here is that my equivalent is then going to be a voltage source, which is VOC. And then I'm going to have some reactants, CTH, given by these guys right here. Right? So this guy has to be 247 ohms at a phase of 16 degrees. And this source here, VOC, has to be 3.71 volts with the phase of negative 16 degrees. And that's that. I think that's it. That's all the phaser calculations I'm gonna do.